Hi Year 4, I'm back and I hope you enjoyed Mr Corn reading Sky Song. I certainly did. Now, I have been following so I haven't missed what's happened but I really can't wait to find out what happens in Chapter 25. So here goes. Esker woke to the Ice Queen's anthem and the sound of a bird call. She pushed back the feather quilt, stretched inside the cage she had slept in and opened her eyes. Balapan was still crouched on the ledge outside it, but Esca knew the call she had heard hadn't belonged to an eagle. A short, sharp yap came again from the entrance tunnel. It was a cry of a snowy owl. Esca had heard a similar call from her hideaway behind the giant's beard, but something about this was slightly different. And then Pip Pip burst into the cavern, and Esca remembered his words from the night before. The snowy owl call was a signal used by the feather tribe, a warning that danger was nearby. The moon flit, Pip Pip cried, as the feather tribe sat up in their cages. She's crying, and her tail's tucked up and shaking. Jay scrambled up the ledges until he came to an empty birdcage not far from Esker. She's gone, he gasped. Rook has gone. The feather tribe leapt out of their cages and reached for their bows and their arrows. She's, she's gone to the Ice Queen, hasn't she? Esker stammered. Jay's face darkened. Perhaps something inside the rook changed a few weeks ago. She came in from a hunt and her thoughts were darker and her words sharper. He shook his head, but I don't believe rook's to blame. I think it's the Ice Queen. Sometimes she's got to rook. Jay glanced towards the tunnels up on the mountains. You must leave now. Your skis won't be much use on the ice flats, but we can lend you a sled and some dogs from the outchambers. Ride fast across the driftlands until you find the grey man. There's no time to spare if the Ice Queen knows where you are. Flint gathered up his sack of snow goose feathers. What if Rook tells the Ice Queen where the entrance to the Lost Chambers is? I have ways of charming the door and changing its location, Jay explained, and then, after a pause, you're not the only one who kept believing in magic when the rest of the tribe turned their backs. Grabbing Pebble from the food store, where he was helping himself to a third breakfast, Flint, Esker and Blue tore through the candlelit passageway after Jay. They ran past chambers filled with furs, bows and arrows, until eventually they came to a small cave that contained ten yapping dogs. Balapan flew to the highest ledge she could find and peered down. The dots were bigger than Flint had been, wolfish grey coats and strong muscular legs, and they crowded round Jay, their tails wagging as he harnessed them to a fur-lined sled. There was a space enough for Eska and Flint to stand on, the runners, and Eska nudged Blue towards the seat in front. For you, Eska whispered, a little throne, and Blue clambered on happily. Pebble swaggered up to the dogs, desperate to be part of the pack, but Flint lifted the fox pup into his arms, dropped him into Blue's lap, and then wedged his sack of feathers at her feet. Working dogs don't eat three breakfasts before a run, Pebble. He climbed onto the back of the sled, but Esker hesitated for a moment and looked at Jay. You will come, won't you? Her voice was a little more than a scratch. When I blow the frost horn. Jay nodded. I'll come. The whole tribe will. I give you my word. And pulling her head up, Esker mounted the sled beside Flint. Words she was beginning to realise were like glue. They held promises and friends together. And though her own words were coming apart, she hoped that Jay's were enough to rouse his tribe when her call came. Thank you for everything, she whispered. Jay smiled when he put his hand on the slab of rock on the chamber wall. Once I open the door here, you'll be out on the driftland. The dogs shifted their weights as if they could sense the journey ahead. Ride fast across the ice and follow the river until it reaches the groaning splinters. You'll find the grey man there. And, though our ancestors talk of a wise old man it's my bet he'll be in pieces in light of what's going on the ice queen's reign won't have been kind to folk like him he pushed against a slab of rock and it crunched forward to reveal a door out of the mountain almost immediately there was a sharp cry and a flap of feathers as balapan glided into the word beyond cold slipped into esker's lungs as she squinted into the silver mist that hung over the driftlands spring hasn't reached the north yet jay said but you'll find the ice makes your travel swift he clasped Esker and Flint's hand, and then he ruffled Blue's hair. Until we meet again. Good luck. And before Esker, Flint or Blue could reply, the dogs lurched forward, hauling the sled out onto the ice as it was several seconds before Flint gathered them under his control. He steered through the mist. How are we going to find the river in this? I can barely see the Nevercliffs behind us, let alone Balapan in front of us. Esker peered through the wisps of white, and they hung like floating ribbons over the ice masking the morning sun, and though the Ice Queen's anthem had now trailed away, every time Esker heard a new sound, the wind moaning, a musk ox grunt, the sp she span around. The mist was a cloak, and the Ice Queen and her sleigh might appear from under it at any moment. Flint nudged Esker. Well, how are we going to find it? 
I'm thinking, Flint, Esco replied. I need quiet for that. Flint tapped his mittens on the sled and Esco tried to ignore him. And as they raced away from the never cliffs, Esco thought carefully. Animals need water to survive, so any wolves or muskoskin that prowl the driftlands would head to the river if they could break a hole in the ice. Follow any animal tracks you find, she said. They'll lead us to the river. But as Esco's eyes flicked downwards, it was not footprints that she saw. All around them now, just only visible through the mist, were caribou antlers shed from the animals themselves the year before. They lay on the ice like stiff white claws. That's odd, Flint murmured. Normally, the hair lemmings and voles gnaw away at the antlers after they've fallen from the caribou. Esca shifted her weight. Why would those creatures suddenly stay away? Look on the tip of every antler, Flint swallowed. I think the smaller animals did come. They just never left. And as Esco peered more closely, she noticed the tiny animal skulls hanging from the antler tips, and Blue tucked her legs up to her chin. Pebble burrowed his head into her furs, and in front of them, the dog's ears cocked this way and that. It was like a graveyard of antlers around them, and Flint did his best to weave his way through. But when the sled crunched over one, the wind died in completely, and the silence that followed pulsed. The Ice Queen's dark magic has been here, Flint whispered. The whole place felt cursed taste of what is to come for the kingdom if we cannot stop her, Eska shivered. Ride faster. Flint urged the dogs on. In the distance they heard a wolf howl. Eska tensed. The sound was low and lingering, like wind moaning through a chimney, and as it rang out the skulls on the antler tips rattled. Then it died away, and a few moments later the sled was free of the antlers, and Eska glimpsed Balapan's silhouette through the mist. She pointed to the snow, wolf tracks leading east, and they followed them until they came to the river, a silent snake winding its way north. A few minutes later. This grey man, what do you think he's like? Esker asked, and Flint flapped his reins and the dog sped on. Old if the Feather Tribe have been singing songs about him for generations, I'm unhappy because the Ice Queen doesn't look kindly on Urk and Ward's magic. Esker nodded. We can cheer him up, especially when he learns that you're an inventor and you might know a way of reaching the stars so that I can blow the frost horn. Flint glanced at Esker. You know inventions don't always work. Yes, so you understand that this one could be a disaster. Yes, so why aren't you more worried? I'm terrified, Eska said quietly, but sometimes all you can do when you're scared is hope. The mist thickened with them noticing at first. It was only when the dogs grew twitchy, shying at fens in the river and flinching at frozen trees that Eska felt her heart quicken. Then the wind picked up, heaving and groaning and stirring the mist so that it rose around them like a slow, creeping wave. The dogs stopped before Flint drew them in, and although they were large, strong beasts, they whined like newborn pups. And then Balapan appeared through the hazy screen and swept low beside Eska. She knew something wasn't right. Blue turned wide eyes to her brother. I scared, Flint. And before Flint could reply, the wind blew harder, whipping the snow and ice up into a swell, into a churn of flakes tore around them and the world seemed to dissolve into white. The dogs backed up towards the sled and Balapan's wings jutted at the wind gathered pace and strength. Eska shielded her eyes with her arm and the snow beat against her. This storm is brewed with the Ice Queen's magic. Keep going! And Flint whipped the dogs on, but as the wind shunted the snow and the ice against the group, the dogs yanked at their harness before snapping free and bounding away into the endless white. The sled ground to a halt again, and the blizzard raged with newfound fury, sending needle-sharp ice against the children's faces. Flint rushed towards Blue and lifted her, Pebble and his sack of feathers from the sled. The group could barely open their eyes in the face of the storm. But Eska managed to, just a crack, and that was enough to see a square shape, a snow-covered foot, food store perhaps, a few metres in front of them. There, she cried, shelter! And Balapin spiralled into the sky and yapped, but her cries were drowned by the smashing of the gale, and Eska, Flint and Blue, staggered towards the hut. They yanked the door, opened it and clattered back against the wall, and when they stumbled over the threshold and hauled the door shut. Join me tomorrow for chapter 26.